Hi, I'm Teresa Younger. I'm the president and CEO of the Ms. Foundation for Women. I am also a board member of a New York Philanthropy and a member of the Annual Planning Committee. This has been an amazing day. I, I'm totally jazzed by all of the speakers that we have seen. So many um, ideas, so many smart people being able to give us something a little bit more to think about. And I know for so many of us in the room, we're thinking and processing about how this will affect our grant making as we move forward. What kinds of conversations do we need to have within our institutions so that we can have the greatest level of impact to really kind of continue the conversation around civic engagement? Today, um, we will hear our, we will have one more speaker, um, keynote speaker tonight, and then we will have, um, Rana will come up and give us short words, I understand, very short words, um, before we move on to what is next. And next is always a good thing. So <laughs> um, some of you may have read in early communications that you would have gotten from Philanthropy New York that we um, were going to have a different speaker. We actually had it originally invited um, Eli P uh, Pariser to come and speak about his book, um, The Filter B Bubble. Unfortunately, Eli, Eli had a family emergency and wasn't able to come today. But, but and I say this because I watched uh, his TED talk earlier today, um, but we have an extraordinary speaker, an activist, a um, thought partner. Some would say he's a big thinker, as he's been noted uh, to be. Um, today we have with us Ethan Zuckerman. Ethan is a thought leader on civic life and in the media. Ethan is the director of the Center for Civic Media at MIT and an associate professor of the practice at MIT Media Lab. His research focuses on the use of media as a tool for social change, the role of technology in international development, and the use of new media technologies by activists. He is the author of Rewire, Digital, uh, digital uh, Cosmopolitans in the Age of Connection. He has also written extensively, and I invite you to all go up and read uh, some of what he's written. Uh, he writes extensively for The Atlantic about civic life in the age of Facebook, and gave a widely viewed TED Talk on listening to global voices that highlighted clever strategies for people to open themselves up to voices they don't usually hear. It's a great TED Talk if you haven't had a chance to listen to it yet. Lucky for us, he also recently presented at the Media Impact Funders annual meeting and when the Media Impact Funders executive director, Vince Staley, um, learned that we of our circumstances that our previous speaker was unable to join us, he connected us with Ethan. And so Ethan, um, we couldn't be more excited that you are here and thank you Vince for this introduction. Thank you, Ethan, for coming all the way down from uh, Western Massachusetts to join us today. Um, it's my understanding that you're going to tell us a little bit about Ben, why Ben Franklin might have something to say about our civic life today. Um, I can't wait to hear about this. Please join me in welcoming to the, to the floor, Ethan Zuckerman. So at this point, you guys have all the secrets, right? You know that I'm pinch hitting. You also know that I'm gonna to try to give you a talk about Ben Franklin, which was great when I was in Independence Hall, in the Ben Franklin Hall. Doesn't necessarily work as well within the Paley uh, Center. But what I really wanna to talk to you about is a problem that I'm dealing with that a lot of friends are dealing with in the media right now, uh, which is a problem that frankly, we don't even like to use the name anymore. None of us wanna use the term fake news. The term has gotten taken over, it's really been sort of adopted, but it's this large species of issues around propaganda, around misinformation, around disinformation. What it really comes down to is that for the most part, we are not especially satisfied with the media environment, both the news media and the social media that we are interacting with as civic actors. And it seems to be having some really negative effects on our democracy. In fact, it's leading us to situations like ones where someone will show up at a pizza parlor and essentially say, uh, I need to investigate whether there's child pornography going on here. 
Uh, some people would argue that it is in fact something that has led us uh, to a point where we have had some elections uh, that, that don't necessarily make sense that end up scaring us. And I have to warn you, not only am I pinch hitting, but evidently my slides didn't work. And so we'll see how this ends up going because there's lots of things missing from these slides. But hey, I'm here for you anyway. I'm here for the rest of the day. Bear with me, I'm really trying here. There we go, all right. So here's the thing, I'm from MIT. You probably assume that I'm here to solve the problem with technology, like my friend Hugh Hare, who builds his own bionic legs, or my friend Neri Oxman, who tries to figure out how to 3D print buildings so they look like natural organic structures, and you're totally wrong, because I'm here with a force even more powerful, it is the force of history. So I'm gonna try to figure out how we might figure out how to build a media environment that helps us as citizens by looking back. And when people look back at media, they tend to look back at a moment like this one. They go back to World War II, they think about Edward Murrow, they think about Walter Cronkite, they think about a moment where people would end a broadcast and say, that's the way it was. And they would mean that earnestly and seriously as if everyone was going to agree that there was one thing that happened that day and we were now going to have a civilized conversation about it. And I wanna tell you that we are not going back to that day. We're not going back to that day for a bunch of reasons. In fact, the one that we don't talk about the most often is an economic reason. When we were at that particular moment, it was a moment of incredible compression in the media environment. We had very few broadcast outlets. We went from having 40 plus daily newspapers in New York City down to a much, much smaller number to three broadcast outlets. And what you had at that point was this incredible monopoly over attention. You had this great way of essentially holding people's attention, selling advertising for enormous amounts of money. And as a result, you ended up with media that was trying incredibly hard to be straight down the middle. It was trying very, very hard not to alienate anyone on any possible side because that was yet one more person who wouldn't see your incredibly expensively crafted ads. This was a very brief moment in American history. It's really from the progressive era into about the Vietnam War, at which point we start seeing fracturing and people breaking away and saying, I'm not sure that we're getting all the voices we need in this system. And when people look back and basically say, can't we go back to the good old days when we actually had objective truth? No. And you don't want to because there are a whole lot of people's voices you weren't hearing then. You were not hearing people of color, you were not hearing women, you were not hearing homosexuals, you were not hearing immigrants, you were not hearing a lot of people who were marginalized in one fashion or another from that discussion. So let's not look back to the 1950s and the 1960s. Let's look a little bit further back because this period of broadcast consensus where it looked like we all more or less disagreed on the same thing, it's now moved to digital dissensus. This moment where we're all flocking to points of view that feel good, that feel like they're being supported by other people who look like us and think like us. And in many ways, this is a media environment that takes us much, much further back. And this is a media environment that also has some really interesting characteristics. It's a media environment that may be much, much more participatory. This is a media environment where when a young black man gets killed on the street and left out in the sun for four hours, it very quickly becomes a popular movement even when CNN doesn't cover it. It's a moment in media where high school kids who are affected by a school shooting are able to become a national political force even when networks are trying to be respectful and careful about interviewing them and they are instead turning directly to Twitter and building their own movement. Now at the same time, let me not be cyber utopian about this. This is also a moment where you have rallies in Texas organized by Black Lives Matter supporters and anti-Black Lives Matter supporters, none of whom were actually supposed to be there because both rallies were called for by Russian propagandists who were hoping that they would yell each at each other in the street. And this is also the moment where really sad, scary, misogynistic men are inciting each other to violence online. This is a really complicated moment in time, and it's one that you actually have to go back quite a bit to understand.
Now, Ben Franklin's the kind of guy that we generally like at a place like MIT. Uh, he liked building stuff. Some of it worked, some of it doesn't. I don't know if you know, but the Franklin stove like, never worked at all. Lightning rods actually worked surprisingly well. They were really good. That's what he got admitted to the Royal Society for. The trick with Franklin, though, is as much as he's known as an inventor, as much as he's known as a statesman and a creator, the job that he had the longest was his postmaster. He gets this job in the 1740s. He holds on to it until the 1770s, which is crazy because he was very clearly a revolutionary and a subversive, as you can see by the fact that he signed letters, be free Franklin. He had franking privileges. He could write free on his envelopes and get them sent for free, but he put the free in the middle of his name so that it would be, be free, you get it. You know. So it, it took the Brits seriously until like 1774 to figure this out. But, <laughs> Ben was a smart dude, and, and the main thing that Ben figured out is that by having the Postal Service, he actually had an amazing amount of political power. He could give wonderful patronage jobs to his friends and family. He was able to support a whole network of people that way. But the real genius of what Franklin did is that he was a printer. He published newspapers. And at that point, there was real questions about the neutrality of the mails. When Franklin was a much younger man, he would publish newspapers, and the local postmaster would look at them and say, I'm not sending this stuff out. And at that point, you had no ability to circulate. So when Franklin becomes postmaster in Philadelphia, rises to become postmaster of the colonies, he comes up with a very progressive and very simple policy. There is one symbol fixed flat rate and I'm not gonna read your mail ahead of time. You can publish whatever you want, I don't care, it's going out. And this ends up being the cornerstone of the press that sort of leads us to the debates about democracy that lead up to the revolution. What ends up emerging out of this is a radically different public sphere than anyone's ever seen before. Right? You guys have heard of Habermas. He's big on coffee houses. He's thinking about Europe, where all the rich people get together. They drink coffee. They talk about the politics of the day. And that's great if you're in Bremen, and everyone can get together and go to the same coffee house. We have a new nation that stretches from Boston to Charleston. It's frickin' huge. And we're trying to govern it through our own governance. We're not just yelling at the king and sort of saying, stop oppressing us. We're actually trying to figure out what this nation is going to look like and how it's going to make decisions. We need a public sphere that operates on print. And what we end up with, with this incredible explosion of newspapers and a postal service that ends up holding it together, is the one form of information environment that would allow us to have a democracy in the late 1700s. So this starts coming about, and this guy steps in and does something pretty amazing. Benjamin Rush is a founding father that most people don't know. He's a full generation after Franklin. He's a physician. He's an amazing guy. He passes, writes and passes a piece of legislation in 1792, which is mind-blowing. It's called the Post Office Act. And it does a couple of things that are really, really subtle, but turn out to be really, really important. The first one is that newspapers become cheap shockingly cheap. Personal correspondence is about 20 times as much as it is to ship a newspaper back and forth. In fact, newspapers are so freaking cheap that if you are a poor person in 1800, the best way to write home to mom is to buy the local newspaper, put pinpricks under the words that you want her to know, hi, mom, doing well, send bread, and send that back because that costs a 20th of what sending a piece of mail costs. The second thing that he does, which is totally insane, is that he says, look, if you publish a newspaper, you can get any other newspaper gratis. The post office will simply carry it to you. It's called an exchange copy. Printers, send out as many as you want. Pass them around. Let's see where they go. By 1820, the average newspaper in the United States receives 4,300 exchange copies per year. This is not like a little bit of, you know, this isn't like when mom clips something out of the paper and sends it home. This is an internet made of print. 
This is an entire ecosystem that takes advantage of the fact that at this point, you know, copyright is, you know, who's enforcing copyright? So what happens is you're a newspaper publisher, you get 4,300 newspapers from the rest of the world, you literally cut them up, retypeset them, put them out, that becomes your own newspaper. The average American household in 1830 has a newspaper, they're reading it every single day, and you end up with this strange phenomenon where essentially the United States in 1830 is a postal system with a very small government and a tiny little military attached to it. 75% of the people who work for the US government work for the post office. And in my state of Massachusetts, which only has 351 towns, we have 400 post offices in 1830. So that's just to try to give you a sense of how incredibly heavily the US government invests in creating this media ecosystem where we can interact with each other as democratic systems. We literally build the post office and the press, and then we build a nation on top of it. And we don't do this by accident. We do this completely conscious of the fact that for a new nation, we need a completely new way to correspond. Now, let me think about a couple of things within this. This is not a system that is yet doing a very good job of representing all voices. It's representing men, it's representing white propertied men, it's representing literate white propertied men. But interestingly enough, it has within it the seeds of something far more subversive. We start seeing freedmen publishing their own newspapers and taking advantage of the same neutral postal system to create a system where free black men and women can correspond with one another. This is also where we see much of the dialogue about equality of the sexes, about the right to vote for women, sort of coming into play. And this is once again made possible by the system that we put together. Um, and I don't even remember what I was gonna tell you here because I don't have my slides and I don't have my notes, but here's what I wanna tell you about. <laughs> this press that our founders work really hard on is not the objective, friendly Walter Cronkite press. It's about as far from it as you can possibly get. You want partisanship? These guys would basically attack each other physically, often, and that ended up being one of the big things documented within newspapers. In fact, political parties in the United States emerge from newspapers rather than the other way around. You've heard of the party press, where we support the left or support the right. Literally, the Federalists come out from Alexander Hamilton running a newspaper. And if you support the Federalists, you are subscribed to Hamilton's Post and you are reading it and that over time becomes a group for people who end up uh, you know, reading and voting and working on that together. Fake news, we got fake news. And it's not just the fact that you have Ben Franklin himself declaring himself a woman, as silents do good, so he can get things published because his brother won't publish him in his own newspaper, the, uh, the New England Current. Um, you have Franklin writing absolute mistruths in newspapers, stuff that's just flat out period false, like that the British are paying the Indians to scalp people as a way of supporting independence. Um, Sam Adams, the beer guy, this guy is actually best known in historical circles as a propagandist and an incredibly successful propagandist. As one of the Sons of Liberty, he's writing in all the major newspapers in New England and he's really going after this guy, Thomas Hutchinson, who is the governor, who's appointed by England to be the governor of Massachusetts at this point. Adams writes that Hutchinson is the guy who is working for the stamp tax. He's going to charge you for every piece of paper, every letter, every publication, every newspaper that you get. And people are so riled up by what Sam Adams has to say that they go to Hutchinson's house, they loot it, and they burn it to the ground. And as you can see, the scholars who have looked at it say that they were jacked up on 90 proof Sam Adams prose. Now the irony in all of this is that Hutchinson actually is against the stamp tax, is trying to persuade England that this is a terrible idea and that the Americans will never let them get away with it, but Sam Adams basically just lies and puts this out in the media and it turns out okay anyway. So here's the thing. I don't want to go back either to the late 1700s or to Murrow, right? Having this highly partisan fake news press 
having this carefully objective but also incredibly limited press, neither of these are particularly good for our moment in time. But when we look at these questions about is Facebook destroying democracy? Is it killing us off? Is it making it impossible for us to have public conversations? We're asking the wrong question. We're treating Facebook, we're treating Twitter, we're treating all of these services like there's some monsters who came down from the woods and were imposed upon us. I built these. People like me, overweight guys who are balding with long hair and increasingly, <laughs> more women who are generally more attractive than I am, but a whole lot of guys who look like me started building these things and we're human and we screw things up and we could make other decisions about how to get there. And if we look back to Franklin and his time, we have a government that very consciously chose what they wanted to favor. They wanted to favor individual voices. They wanted to favor the spread of that information throughout the entire country. They wanted to favor discourse, even if it was partisan or rancorous, because they knew that was how we got to a functioning democracy. Here's a friend of mine, Mike Shudson. Teaches at Columbia Journalism School, incredibly smart guy, should get more attention than he generally does wrote an article 10 years ago, and he basically said, look, the press is in real trouble. Before we figure out how to save the newspaper, let's ask ourselves what it is that we actually want the press to do for us. What does it need to do for us in a democracy? And some of these things that he came up with are really non-controversial. I think everyone would sort of assume that you want the press to inform you, you want it to investigate stories, you want some analysis. You know, what's gonna come out of the summit in North Korea? Some of them are a little weirder. Public forum. The press can provide a space where we can have these sorts of debates that we were having in Franklin's times. We can use this as a tool for social empathy. I can help you care about issues that you don't think about by writing well about them and doing high quality storytelling. The press can mobilize you. We have a real taboo against this in the United States, but it's something that we should actually try to get over because sometimes you need the press to help people get together and move. And we do it just around non-political issues. When the New York Times says, let's get together for Hurricane Sandy relief, no one complains because there is not a strong pro-hurricane community out there. <laughs> but we may need to mobilize around other issues. And Schutzen really controversially says, maybe what the press should do is explain its own role. How does it fit into participatory democracy? So I'm completely immodestly ripping off my friend and suggesting that we have a similar conversation. And this conversation is about what could we do with social media for democracy. So rather than looking at this and saying, how do we keep Facebook from killing us? Here is my affirmative agenda for what social media might be able to do. It might be able to inform us, but in a really different way way. Because social media is radically participatory, you can have people who don't have a voice in the media move online and they can tell you what's going on in their communities and potentially that can influence what's going on in the media. Social media is an incredibly powerful amplifier. When people start saying, I want to hear more about what's happening in Ferguson, I want to know what happened with Michael Brown, then reporters go there and pay attention to it. We have a system where the press and social media end up enforcing and reinforcing one another. You can use social media for people to connect, to find communities of interest. We see this all the time within political movements on the left and on the right. We see people finding their identities, their communities, their group of people, and using it to mobilize. We don't see a ton of this right now in social media, but there's no reason why social media couldn't be a platform for reason, debate, and deliberation. The platforms we have are terrible at this but they haven't been built for that. The platforms we have right now are built to make us angry because when we stay angry, we keep looking. Partisanship and polarization is an amazing business model, but it's possible that we could do something else. It's possible that social media, which my friend Eli Pariser, who was supposed to be here instead of me, but hey, I'm taking it for him, was gonna tell you that social media locks us in an echo chamber, but it doesn't have to. You can build social media so that what it actually does is introduces you to different people, gives you diversity.
Some of the most incredible things we're seeing are communities like Reddit that govern themselves online, and we can actually use social media as a way to think about getting people engaged in governance and in civics, even if they're not engaged with traditional politics. Here's the thing. We are at the moment of blowing our chances. We have meetings, literally, I can go to one every second day about combating fake news. And what everyone is trying to do is what we tried to do a decade ago, which is do fact checking. We're going to make it so that lies never get out there. We're going to go and do PolitiFact again. I love PolitiFact, but it has not changed the fact that politicians lie. It simply makes some of us more smug about the fact that politicians lie. We cannot do this same thing around fake news. It is not enough just to identify it and to label it. We have some really hard work to do. I work at one of the best technical institutions in the world. I study this stuff. I cannot tell you with a straight face that I know whether Cambridge Analytica affected the 2016 race or not, period. And anyone who tells you that they have an answer to that question is lying to you. We don't know yet. We are trying to learn and understand how this system works. And there's a bunch of people who are starting to ask these questions, but we need help. We need the data. We need to actually organize research around this. Facebook, in its recent Cambridge Analytics th uh, thing, essentially shut down access to all scholars. We can't even get in there anymore. We need to study not just the digital media. We know that some of the most interesting media is AM radio. It's talk radio. It's the television. We're in a presidency right now where what shows up on Fox and Friends is one of the most important things politically. We need to figure out how that interacts with all of this other media. And we need to figure out how to stop complaining about this stuff and start affirmatively building stuff that's better. And that may not mean building it commercially. That may mean using philanthropic dollars. Think about things like the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. What would it mean to actually build public-funded, social-purpose social networks? My heavily dreaded friend, Jaron Lanier, here just published a book, 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media. Screw this guy. I'm sick of this. I am really sick of people complaining about this and not actually finding a way to do something about this. Ben Franklin famously said, well done is better than well said. We need to move beyond this state of critique. We need to actually move to figuring out what's broken with the media system we have right now. How would we build a better one? We could do it more than 200 years ago. I bet we could do it now. Thank you for your patience. For that. Thank you, Ethan. I'm not Rana, in case you're confused. Uh, but I'm Mike again. It's, I just thank you so much for those intriguing words. It's, uh, uh, it's almost too, too hard to end the day on such an up note of uh, an engagement. But we have an opportunity, to, do, as Teresa also mentioned, to do it over drinks and, and whatever. So that, that's a, that's a, the, the conversation should and will continue. Um, it really struck me. Uh, so many things struck me today. One of just sort of pride in who we are, our, the philanthropic sector in general, but PNY in particular, being able to pull these wonderful speakers together and engage all of you and all of your participation. So I thank you and I thank the staff again for a, a wonderful, wonderful day. A lot of things stick with me. I'm sure that we can talk about this uh, in a moment. Being big and bold. Uh, leading with the heart, trusting our grantees. I was talking to Sayu after she got off the stage and she was talking about all the extraordinary ways that people came forward after 9-11, after, after Sandy, uh, in, the, in the recession, more recently. And I thought also to myself, isn't it great that there were the organizations like with Steve Choi and others, uh, Javier, who came, who were already built with philanthropic dollars to respond to those crises. So I just, lots of things going on. We're going to continue the conversation at PNY. We're going to have uh, more conversations related to Census 2020, women of color as driving forces in politics, cross-movement building, and multiracial 
coalitions, modernizing and protecting electoral systems, civic education for adult American adults, and links between economic justice and democracy and the power that workers banding together can bring to communities. So lots, lots to come. We're working on promising practices as part of our strategic plan. This seems to be a wonderful kickoff to a year of beginning and refining our focus on what are great philanthropic promising practices. So we're now, we have reached an end. I want to uh, invite all of you uh, to join us for a reception hosted by City Foundation, uh, Yoda Connects, uh, Be Live, CBiz, and Condon O'Meara on the main entrance level uh, on the floor above us. And on behalf of the board and staff, I want to thank everyone for coming today. We look forward to an outstanding year of working together.